Hello, and welcome to today's discussion on how to find a job you love. My name is Aaron Anderson, and on behalf of Boys and Girls Clubs of America and our founding workforce partners, Toyota and the Coca-Cola Company, I'm excited to welcome you here today as we look forward to hearing from a group of dynamic and seasoned professionals. At Boys and Girls Clubs of America, we are committed to ensuring young people are on their path to a great future and prepared for work and life. Finding a job that makes you feel professionally and personally fulfilled isn't easy and rarely happens on your first try. Today's panelists will offer their thoughts and advice on how we can all find a career that provides meaning and satisfaction. I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Tiffany Hedden. As a corporate communications analyst for Toyota, Tiffany has nearly 20 years of experience in marketing and communications. She oversees Toyota Motor Manufacturing Indiana, community partnerships and outreach, volunteerism, and the Toyota for Good giving platform. Also joining us today is Erica von Heilen Strader. Erica has been part of the Coca-Cola family for more than 20 years, and in her role as the Director of Community Marketing and Engagement, she leads strategic nonprofit partnerships with Boys and Girls Clubs of America and numerous other organizations. Erica is also a two-time U.S. Olympian. And our final panelist is David James. David is the Vice President of Baseball and Softball Development for Major League Baseball, where he is responsible for getting more youth involved in playing ball. This includes Play Ball, Reviving Baseball in Inner Cities, RBI, and MLB's two national youth skills competitions, Pitch, Hit, and Run, and Junior Home Run Derby. And moderating today's panel is Boys and Girls Club alumnus Dorian Holness. Dorian is an employer brand specialist for the Boston-based tech startup, Vendor. He grew up as a Boys and Girls Club kid and was the 2016-17 Southeast Military Youth of the Year winner. Thank you everyone for being here today. And now I'll turn it over to Dorian to ask our first question. Thanks, Aaron. I'm really excited to be here today. And as a young professional myself, I'm excited to hear all the advice this experienced panel has to offer. If you have a question today during today's discussion, please drop it in the Q&A box. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end of the hour together. So let's get started. As we mentioned earlier, finding a job you love doesn't always happen the first time around. So for our first question, how do you define a job that you love? And did you always have a job that you love? So Tiffany, we'll start with you. Hey, Dorian, thank you so much. And hey to everybody out there. Um, so no, I didn't always have a job that I loved. and I, I hope that everybody will have that experience. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because it not only gives you a really good appreciation for a job that you do love when you have that, but it also helps direct you and guide you to finding that on your path. Um, it's important to, to go and, and check out different skills, different opportunities to guide you down that road. Um, and a lot of that you'll find it's not only about what you like to do, but what you don't like to do. Um, and to be able to pair that with your personal and your professional skills that you really wanna hone, that you wanna develop and that you wanna grow. And there is nothing worse than going to a job every day you hate. So that's why it's so important to be able to find something that you do love. And now in this day and age, we have um, plenty of opportunity to be able to do that. Awesome. Um, moving on to Erica, what do you think about this? Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, gosh, for me, it's three things. Passion, company aligned values and culture, and a boss that makes me feel valued. So having a job that I'm passionate about is important to me. A role that I can get excited about going to work each and every day makes a huge difference. One that it's meaningful, uses my skill set, yet enables growth and learning. And another important thing is one that encourages me to step outside of my comfort zone. So feeling valued for my contributions to me is also extremely important. Having a boss that exemplifies the company values is a great coach and mentor, empowers and trusts you to do the work that matters most and enables you to learn and develop is also important. So if you're lucky enough to find a job that aligns with your passions, 
interest and goals, working for a boss that you respect, for a company with similar values and culture, to me, that's a winning formula, which will make you want to get out of bed each day and conquer the world. However, here's my disclaimer. I've not always found the job that I love, um, as Tiffany had so eloquently started with. But one thing that was different is I've always worked for companies that have aligned with my values and belief system. This enabled me to navigate through those varying roles that fit my areas of interest, my skill set, my passions, and ultimately get to my dream job, which is where I am right now. I've been in this for 11 years. Most people at Coke don't stay in the same role for more than five years, but you know, as director of community marketing for Coca-Cola North America, I absolutely love what I do and I'm not leaving till it's time. <laughs> and that, that's Back to awesome. you, Dorian. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And, um, and David, what about you? How do you find or how do you define a job that you love? <laughs> well, I think both Tiffany and Erica really hit on some of the key points of it. Uh, but, you know, you enjoy the work that you do, um, that it's impactful, that you're making a difference. And, and when you talk about making a difference, whether it be, you know, personally for you as an individual, but your family, but also making a difference into the, you know, the respective communities that your job is taking you into. Um, obviously, I'm in a position, you know, in regards to the sports industry, but I was never really uh, had any aspirations to actually become a player and quite honestly, you know, wasn't a good player but, you know, had an affinity for the game and presented other opportunities to me, you know, thinking about this particular question, my first official job as a kid was a, a scorekeeper at a local little league. And that was my first four way job that, you know, I was doing something that I was getting paid for. And uh, along the way had uh, other opportunities to continue to stay involved in the sport and have other opportunities that were presented. So, Sometimes the opportunities, the love of a particular job, your growth in it is, you know, in, you know, factors will will pop up that you don't expect that give you opportunities to to learn to grow and, and learn to love, you know, the career that you're in. Oh, yeah, for sure. So moving on to our next question, this one's going to be for the whole panel. How can those entering the workforce or early in their career identify and pursue their passions? And um, let's kick this off with David again the things that you like to do and, you know, talking to, you know, boys and girls club kids, you know, you have a, a lot of different interests uh, and some of them, you may not necessarily think that there's an opportunity to create a career out of that. Uh, so, you know, always take a look at the things that you're good at, the things that you like to do, the things that maybe you see sometimes on TV or, or, you know, other places you go, boy, I wonder how, you know, they got to that particular position. So being able to take a risk is, is important in, in doing that, you know, what they pick ultimately, that's going to show them what they're passionate about. Oh yeah. And, and what about you, Erica? How can those entering the workforce earlier in their career identify and pursue their passions? So for me, I mean, I guess holistically, there's not a specific roadmap or true formula, but for me, it helped to be able to be aware of what were the key things that are important to me professionally and personally. For some, you know, a lot of folks know early on, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer, or whatever field or study that they're interested in. Some of it, they happen by accident, some because they had a friend or a family member that was interested in the same field. For others, it's how a typical lifestyle or pace may motivate them, or how being around certain cultures make them feel. A perfect example of that is Southwest Airlines. So I had the good fortune of being able to work on Southwest Airlines for seven years while at Coca-Cola. And I was actually hired on attitude. A lot of young people gravitate to Southwest Airlines because of their culture. It's fun, it's an environment of learning. And so that's another key indicator. Another good exercise in identifying initial interest or thinking through what you might be passionate about is exploring certain jobs and fields and looking at the key skill sets. What are the hours? What are the requirements? What are the environments? 
that are needed to be successful and then visualize yourself living that life. How do you feel about it? You may find out there that their career specific to those things you've identified as important and that your passions and interests are transferable. So it's not the end of the world. You don't have to have one exact career. It could be transferable to so many different careers later in life. What is important to do early on is to be intentional. Some folks go through years and years of study and training only to decide they hate what they do. Now, they completely switch careers after 10 years of study. It's not the end of the world. So when that happens, it's not the end of the world. Know that and that your skills, when you build transferable skills, you're going to be all right. To you, Tiffany. Yeah, and what about you, Tiffany? (laughs) I just want to emphasize a couple of things that both David and Erica said. So, um, you know, you, it, it's got to resonate with you, right? You have to have, you have to feel something inside. Um, and then also embracing failure, like Erica said, um, those are two key things that I think are so important, not only for pursuing passions, identifying them, but, you know, in a professional career and also a little bit of personally who you are as an individual. Um, you know, at Toyota, we, we empower our team members to implement changes, to own their process, to own their, um, their, their roles and what they do. And we also want them to embrace failure so that we can turn that into good change or what we call Kaizen in Japanese. Um, and that is a recipe really for success in life and, and careers. So when you're going out and you're thinking about a job or a career or just something that you might want to try, um, you know, be open to that, but also let your passions like personally guide you. Um, if you don't like public speaking, don't take a role in that or pursue something. But if you like math, if you like working with people, if you, um, if you like, you know, community involvement, look for something along those lines and try it out and see, see where it leads you. And don't be afraid to, you know, try something for a few years and then completely shift gears. Um, I think now it's, it's kind of difficult to, to say, okay, you've graduated from high school. Now go get a job and make it your career for your life. That, that isn't what happens. And thankfully, that's not what happened to me. And throughout my professional career, I did different jobs with different companies that all prepared me for everything that I do in one role at Toyota. And that's when I knew I had really arrived at the place where I was supposed to be and call home is because I love every single thing that I do, but I had to take pieces from my past to get me to where I am. And there were some struggles, but they definitely help you um, get ready for what's to come. So stay strong. (laughs) Thank you for that. Erica, I'm curious. What decisions or risks did you take earlier in your career that led you to where you are today? Wow, that's a loaded question. So for me, I had a very non-traditional career. By that, I didn't have a, I did not actually start my formal work career for a company until I was 30 years old. So I had the distinct privilege and honor to be able to travel around the world and and compete as a professional athlete and represent my country. But I have to tell you that every single tool, so I was competing around the world to try to qualify for the Olympics. I did this for over 12 years and every single tool or transferable skill needed to be successful in life actually learned on my journey to the games. So simple things like striving for excellence, being the best that you can be, not leaving anything half done. These are some basic foundational skills, for example, that I was able to carry into the workforce. But I can tell you this much, while I was competing and training for the Olympics, nearing retirement from competition, I had a clear plan. I had a clear plan of a few companies that I was interested in working for, and I set my sights on learning all about them. So right after the Olympics in 1996, I moved to Atlanta. I went to work for Coke. But you know what? I was not sure in any way, shape, or form what I wanted to do. I didn't even know what skills I was good at what skills I excelled in and what I was passionate about. However, the one thing that I was sure of 100% is that I wanted to work for the Coca-Cola company. 
I visualized myself walking into that building on North Avenue. And I can't tell you that today, 20 years later, I still have the same passion when I walk in that building as I did the first day. Why is that? Because it aligned with my values and my long-term vision. I knew the company was big enough for me to find a place I would call home. Fortunate for me, I love my first role in sales and account management and found that what it is I love was I really like being around people. I like building relationships. I like being outside. So what did I do? I honed my skills necessary to excel and be the best at getting better as I matured in my career. I set my sights on a national account manager role along with a timeline and a pathway to get there. I also learned, as all of you will, that there's several things about the job that I did not like, but that's just part of growing up. It's part of everyday, you know, everyday life, or there are things that I could see, not see myself doing for a long time. So with that, I built my go forward plan, learning how to maximize my strengths and yet minimize my weakness and still go on to be successful. And, um, and what about you, Tiffany? Oh, well, this is about what I said earlier, remember guys, about how everyone should have a job that they don't particularly enjoy. Um, and, and it's, you know, life just leads you in that, down that path, right? Um, I would say a couple of the biggest risks I took uh, because I knew that the outcome would be a really good investment was going back to college. So I graduated high school. I knew I was going to go to college. I went to college. And in the, in that day and age, if you will, um, there was not a lot of career awareness. There was not a lot of choices out there, or at least awareness of those choices. And there weren't a lot of resources to help students really figure out, you know, A, what exists, and then B, like, how do you find that? How do you pair yourself to those that prof those professional skills or, you know, pair what you like to do personally with a job. And there wasn't that awareness. So I, I was a little lost. Um, I knew that I wanted to go to college because I wanted to get a really good job. Um, but it kind of, I, I ended up wandering around for a little while. Luckily, I had a really good job with a great company, a great corporation um, that had great values, like Erica said. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try to climb the corporate ladder for a little while and there was some good opportunity. And so I did that. I, I decided not to go to college after my first two years. And I invested all my time and energy in focusing on a career. And what I realized was a lot of different things. I realized that I had really good talent, um, that I knew I was going to go somewhere. And I was a hard worker and I was dedicated. And I wanted to belong to a company that cared about its people and about its customers. But the opportunity that I saw for myself was not with the company I was with. And I wasn't gonna get there unless I got a degree. So after five years, I went back to college as a non-traditional student and it took a leap of faith knowing that I was gonna get a degree, I was gonna choose a path that paired with something I was good at and that I liked to do, which was public relations and communications and writing. And I would figure it out from there. So after I graduated, I had some um, job experience, I had some internships, and I took another leap of faith, and I took a job for a company that would build my resume, but it docked my pay several dollars per hour, which was a big risk because, you know, you're a grown up now, you've got a house, you've got a car, um, but I knew that the opportunity it would provide me would inevitably get me to the place that I wanted to go. And so that was a leap of faith. Um, and it took some time to work through, um, but it did end up doing, uh, benefiting me in the long run. So I absolutely took risks. I think that there's only, there's only room for that, right? Because if you always play it safe, you're going to have regrets. Um, and, and like I said, it's okay to fail. If it doesn't work out, have a backup plan, make sure that you always do, that you always got another option and something else to do, and that you have a good support system of individuals who can either be there to pat you on the back and to pick you up when you fall down, or can be there to advocate for you and to champion you in a career or a path um, that you know, you're gonna eventually take. And my last piece of advice would be, don't count anything out. 
because you never know where you'll end up and you never know what surprises you'll find that you think you weren't going to enjoy or you think you couldn't be good at, but you really are. Thank you for sharing that. And um, this next question is, is for David. So how does a company's culture impact job satisfaction? And that, that plays a big role uh, in your career and your experience and your career path. Um, you know, uh, do you like what you do? Simply put, do you, you know, believe in the mission of the, of the company and, and what they've hired you to do? I think that plays a huge role. And, and it's, you know, quite honestly, culture can be determined in, in a lot of different ways. If, you know, you, you want to work for a company that's going to help you make a whole lot of money and, and their culture is, you know, to, to generate revenue, that's a good fit. If, you know, you want to be more impactful, you know, and, and if you do a little bit of research on the companies that, uh, that you know, that, that you're looking to, to be hired at. Um, it, I think what's quite interesting is the last year and a half, two years, culture, you know, really shown for a lot of companies. And, and I think we're still going through this as a society now, you know, is this where I want to work? Is this what I want to do? You know, the, 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 the conversations, especially, you know, to our audience, a lot of young people, you know, what do I want to do with my life? You know, do I just want to worry about making money or do I want to do something that I feel is, is making a positive impact? So, you know, I think the big thing that you have to do is, is do your research and, and you know, really find out, you know, what are the core missions and goals of companies that you want to work with or the ones that you're working with currently uh, to make sure that it meets your ideals and values? Because ultimately, if it does, you're going to be more productive. You're going to feel good about what you do. And that helps you from an advancement standpoint. If you're excited, you're eager, you believe in the tasks and the role that, that you have. So research is, is a lot of it, but uh, you know, don't, you know, don't shortchange yourself in regards to what are your goals and, you know, what am I trying to achieve in my career and, and for my family or my financial needs? That's okay too. Awesome. And, uh, and Tiffany, you've talked about Toyota's culture before. So I, I want to give the same question to you as well. Yes. Um, well, I, I could not say enough good things about Toyota and the company I work for. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned before, when I, when I arrived at this role, um, I was not only looking for satisfaction in the job that I do, but also with the company. Uh, and, and to echo what David and Erica have said, it, it, it's paramount to be in a place that you feel supported and valued as a person. And um, there were you know, jobs along the way where I didn't feel like there was opportunity for progression, where there wasn't career development for me and my skills, uh, and where there weren't enough resources for me to be able to do my job well, and then to grow within it. And so when I came to Toyota, I was seeking that. I knew that I needed to be happy in my work, but I needed a company that would support me and embrace me and value me for who I am, value that, you know, um, give me an opportunity to be my unique self. And that also instilled that culture among our people too. Um, and Toyota does that. I mean, we, we strive to be diverse in our culture, not only with how we look and who we are, but the talents that we have and the ideas. Um, and to have a diverse population of people to work around, you're going to build the greatest ideas. You're going to have the best strength of culture because it's different. Uh, if we were all the same, it would be boring and we'd just be doing the same thing. Um, and then also to value respect for people. And that's one of Toyota's key pillars and has been a key to our success since our company has been um, in existence. And that just means that it's more than treating people how you want to be treated, but it's respecting their expertise, their process, what they bring to the table. It's respecting their differences and looking at them as a person and um, being kind and collaborative and all of those things that come along with a great culture of respect. And to me, that is, that is like the basis of a foundation for a good job. 
And once you have that, and that company believes in it so strongly that it builds into it, its fabric, those, that mission and, and those um, kind of those morals, then all, you know, all the team members and the employees are gonna have a great basis to then be happy, feel empowered, to do their best work and be them the best version of themselves. Um, and I could not be more grateful to have that foundation at Toyota. Um, and I know Erica and David too feel the same about their companies. Mm -hmm. So this next question is gonna be for Erica. How does having a career mentor um, help you out? Sorry about that. I was on mute there for a second. Gosh, just the mentor in life is, is so critical and important. It's like having a coach my whole athletic career. So to me, it, it could be helpful in several ways, helping you hone your skill set to be your best self, to get better at being better, ensuring you're continuously stretching beyond what is comfortable, helping you develop skills to prepare for your next, jo next job. Equally as important is in selecting a mentor is selecting one that aligns with someone you respect and admire, but is also inspirational. Someone, someone that you know will provide constructive feedback. And this thing is really important. Align yourself with a mentor that is gonna provide fierce, uncomfortable conversations. These are necessary to help keep it real and moving in the right direction. One of the most pivotal times in my career was about, I don't know, um, five, five to seven years ago. And there was someone on my team that I knew if I aligned and had her do a 360 on me, she was going to tell me the truth. That became a turning point because I enlisted folks that I knew were not my best friends that were critical. And it was the best advice that I got to do that because I have taken those learnings and really grown as a result of that exercise. Back to you, Dorian. All right, and I'm going to pass it over to David. Same question. Um, how does having a career mentor help you throughout your career? Well, I think Erica actually, yeah. using a baseball term, sort of hit it out of the park on there and, and, and echo uh, a lot of, uh, of what she touched upon. But, but that mentor, I, I think I would actually add a little bit of plural to that also. You know, it makes sure that you identify with as many people as possible. And I know a lot of times for me, you know, I will go to a department and, and, you know, connect with someone that actually works in an area that I'm not familiar with. And not only, you know, are they helping me, uh, you know, learn another skill, but I'm doing the same for them. So, you know, if you have multiple mentors and, you know, multiple disciplines based upon, you know, what your career goal is, what you want to do within your company, you know, that, that ultimately those mentors ultimately turn into a network also, which will help you, you know, moving forward. All right. And, and this next question is going to be for the entire panel. So what is the best piece of professional advice you've received and what advice or considerations would you share with today's young people to find a job that they truly love? Let's start with Tiffany. Oh my goodness. Well, um, I've definitely received a good bit of professional advice over the years, but notably I would say something that stands out to me was um, to lean into opportunities. Uh, it was in, I, my job scope was changing and it wasn't for any reason other than that's just how the company did things. Um, and it was really to, to create a more well-rounded opportunity for all the employees, but I was really resistant to that. I was holding on to uh, some things that I'd love to do, um, and I didn't see past that to see the opportunity presented to me, which was some really new projects that I could do, and I could totally rock them. And so my mentor said to me, lean into this as an opportunity and take every bit of your energy and your passion for what you do and throw it into this because I know you're going to do great and I know that you're going to succeed and that's why I'm giving this opportunity to you um, and I took that to heart I did I said okay you know what if I do that and I still fail then I can go back and I can get help but I didn't I didn't fail it was a great opportunity it 
who elevated the work that I was doing and it gave me visibility in my role to where I was getting more and more opportunities and they were just coming in one after the next after the next. And had I not received that advice and continued to be resistant and think of it as a, like a bad thing and not a good thing, I would have held myself back. And so when I said earlier, like, you, you know, don't discount anything. Um, because you never really know, try to look at everything as an opportunity, even if it's a change or like if the last two years have shown us anything, um, an unpredictable out of your control change, um, try to find the good in those situations and look at everything as an opportunity and lean in, throw every talent and every resource you have into it and stretch yourself. Awesome. And what about you, Erica? Yeah, so I'm going to answer this a little differently. So I've received a lot of professional advice, but what I'd like to do is just share like some random uh, pieces of advice that have been helpful for me along my journey to finding the job I love and actually living a meaningful life. So the first one is life will throw you so many curveballs. Here's this baseball analogy again that you did not expect. Failing at something along the way in your journey is not the end of the world. In fact, it's real, it's necessary, and it's a part of life. It's what you do after in that actual moment or situation that will define your career path. Reflect on the learnings. Put a plan in place to ensure that you don't repeat the same mistake twice. Number two, as part of my journey to becoming just an overall champion in life. I learned to look at obstacles that life throws my way, to Tiffany's point, as merely challenges. And I looked at those challenges as true opportunities for success, Tiffany's point again. Changing my perspective helped me not only push forward, but also meet and exceed expectations. So here's one for you guys, here's the challenge. Step into a mess and clean it up. So I don't mean a physical mess, but a business problem or opportunity and make it a challenge. Tiffany's point again, she did that. She leaned in. If you look at it as a challenge, it'll give you an opportunity to shine. You may find that you actually enjoyed it and that you learned a lot and you made a huge impact. Number three, and I want you to to walk with me on this. Imagine yourself walking into an auditorium early to grab a seat, you're going into a national conference. Where do you sit? I can assure you, majority of you will most likely sit towards the middle or the back. Here's my advice. Take it to heart, I promise you. Get out of the balcony and get a front row seat in life. How do you do it? Start by physically, this is a physical motion, sitting in the front row seat at an event. Create your own opportunities. Get out of your comfort zone. Head to the front row every opportunity you can. Will it be intimidating at first? Absolutely. I did it about eight years ago. I sat in the front row. Now I sit in the front row every time. Then it becomes natural. It'll bleed to every part of your life and you'll create natural confidence. I tried it and never looked back. Number four, kindness absolutely matters in life. Integrity is important. Everything communicates. And lastly, it is so critical to evaluate and reflect on your career every one to two years to ensure you're on track, that you're aligned to your passions, and you are truly doing what matters to you. I mentioned earlier, I started my formal work career at 30. Today at 55, I'm proud to say I just announced my retirement from Coke at the end of October. And I thought when I started, oh my God, I'm 30, it's so late when I was starting. So as a result, I was very intentional about how I approach my career. I attached myself to mentors, plural. I attach myself to folks that are not gonna be yes people, but that are gonna really truly challenge me. And you know what? Today I have absolutely no regrets. So thank you for for having me on this panel. I think that was our last question. Yeah, well, and, uh, yeah again, just knocked it out of the park. So um, uh, I'm gonna pass this over to, to David to, to close us up. 
All right, thank you, Dorian, and both Erica and Tiffany, thank you. Uh, a lot of great stuff and uh, honored to be on this panel uh, with you. Um, for me, um, best advice, I think, for personally and professional advice has been sometimes the hard conversations, you know, and, and hearing, you know, frank conversation about, you know, uh, where I stand within the company, things done, level of work, things like that. And ultimately, you know, where your career goes, it, 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 a lot of times it can be defined by some of those hard moments. And what do you choose to do, you know, to change that narrative? Um, and then just, I, I sort of want to wrap up just sort of with a little bit of a philosophy for me. And I learned this a long time ago when I was a, a younger man. And uh, I, I sort of operate with this philosophy that you're nice to the lunch ladies and the janitors. And so when you're hungry, the lunch lady will always feed you when something's broken, the janitor will fix it for you. And so you treat everybody with respect, regardless of the level. And that's important to me internally within the company that I talk to all levels of, you know, coworkers in, in the same way. It's, it's being all part of one big team. So, but thank you for having me on. Greatly appreciate it. No, thank you all for this uh, great conversation. I know everyone enjoyed it. And me as a young professional too, I've really enjoyed hearing your responses. So now it's time to take some of the questions from our audience. So reading the chat box, the first question is how long do you recommend staying at your first job? And is it okay to leave in the first year if you're really unhappy? So let's start with uh, Tiffany for this question. Well, one of the pieces of advice I received when I was a young professional was pertaining to this question. And my mentor told me, you have to make it a year. You have to. Um, and when you start to build your resume, you'll see that, you know, you don't have much at the beginning. So if you want to move on to something else, you really need to give it a good try. Um, and, and that's okay if they're extenuating circumstances, but to show that you stuck it out, that you're committed, um, it's, it's more about doing the job and the work. It's about gaining the experience and building relationships and honestly enduring some things that are uncomfortable. Um, you know, like, like David said before and Erica, and um, as best you can, you know, put your best foot forward and try because you will not always be there. I promise you, you will not always be in a place that is not good for you. That's not meant for you. Um, but you really need to go through that to be able to get on the other side. And what about you, Erica? Gosh, this is, I guess this one is a, there's no easy answer, but a lot of what Tiffany said really resonates. Um, I think it's important when you first start out your career, not to just bounce or not to have true intention. But I think if you're in a situation that you're faced with, that you're not happy, you don't see yourself growing, I would take a step back and think about, again, what really matters why am I here? How long do I want to be here? What would the impact be if I left? And then once you decide holistically what I need to do, then you need to throw your heart and soul and your, change your mindset. And if you decide, I got to stay here for two years, then make it the best two years that you've ever had and learn everything you can. I know folks at Coke that have no experience in marketing that came from finance and they were just so not enjoying their roles. And what they did is they said, you know what? I'm going to go to Coca-Cola University and I am going to learn everything I can about marketing. And right now they're an SVP of marketing today. They had no idea. They started out in finance. But because of their finance acumen, they're very successful at thinking differently when everybody is so yellow. Um, their finance people are more blue-green. And I'm thinking of Herman brain dominance. <laughs> So just embrace it, you know, and don't just quit until you've exhausted every possibility and then be the best at whatever it is you're doing. So to David's point, you know, if you're a janitor, be the best janitor you could be. If you're a CEO, be the best that you can be. But everything you do, everything communicates and people are watching. So there you go. <laughs> And what about you, David? How do you feel about um, staying in a job for at least a year? 
you, especially, I think early on in your career, this is my opinion, you know, as you're trying to figure out what works for you, it, it maybe doesn't hurt your resume that much. I, I think a lot of people will give some consideration if they see a little bit of a movement, but at some point you, you, you sort of have to, to lock in and, and, you know, not only are you seeing that you're not there, you know, for a year or more, but suddenly you're sort of changing disciplines, you know, then that may be when you really have to do a little bit of, you know, self-reflection and say, okay, really, what is my plan? What do I want to do? How do I get there? Because that resume is, you know, a, a public presentation of, of who you are and, you know, in order for folks to get a, a feel for you. So, and I, I've, we deal with a lot of younger people who, you know, are looking for a job in the industry and things like that. And so you're sort of used to that, but at some point, you know, when you get that interview, that's for that, you know, this is a, a medium type job that could lead to a bigger position, things like that you also have to be prepared. Sometimes if you get that interview, you may have to explain, you know, what your path was up until this point. All right. Let's go back to the chat. See what else we have here. So question number two, how do I balance the desire for working a job I love with the need for a salary that meets my basic needs? So let's start with uh, Erica for this question. Right. So it's balancing working for, Doing a job I love with a salary that meets my basic needs. Gosh, I think everything has has to have perspective. So it could be that maybe you have to rebalance your budget. I don't know, because if it doesn't meet your basic needs and maybe evaluate, because most, most jobs should, um, it's an assumption of mine, meet your basic needs. So I think it's just really thinking through What's truly important? Um, if you really love the job, think about where it's going to get you in the future. Perhaps that's a tough one. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to call on my colleagues to help me here, <laughs> but I, I've always been a proponent of living within my means. And mm -hmm. so, the, the day I started working at 32, I called my dad and I said, "There's got to be more to life. All I do is work to eat to pay bills." And he goes, just keep, keep on the path. But remember, you got to You got to save first. And that's what I did my whole life. I lived within my means. And I'm not saying this person may not live within their means, but I think it's all a matter of reevaluating your perspective and looking further as to what is that a stepping stone stone to it's not going to be permanent that that happens. All right. So for question number three, how do you know it's the right time to move to a different company? And let's kick this off with, um, with David. I haven't had to do that in a while, so that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think, you know, I, I have a lot of former coworkers and I think, you know, folks know. Uh, sometimes that's, that's the reality of, uh, you know, the, the work landscape. And so it's a little bit different now. So there are a lot of opportunities and I think we all probably, and, you know, even, you know, the younger folks that are on or know someone that have decided, you know, to change positions or, you know, do other things as a result of everything we've gone through over the last couple of years. So ultimately you have to do what you feel is, is right for you. And, and, you know, it's true to your morals and, and, and your values, but, but, you know, our audience who were, who we're talking to, you know, you're young and the world's ahead of you and you have all sorts of opportunities. So, you know, don't be so quick sometimes either, you know, let things play out. Oh, yeah. And so let's look at the questions again. All right. So we have question number four coming in. And this is, um, of course, open forum, too, for anyone who wants to answer. Do you have any tips for dealing with challenging coworkers?
Oh my goodness. <laughs> I think <laughs> we've, we've, We've all been there. Um, we'll all continue to be there, right? We're all different people, as I mentioned earlier, and we work different ways. Um, I think some key, some core tips would be always be respectful, um, but practicing empathy can go a long way. And so a lot of times you really, you, you don't know why a person may be, you know, confrontational or they just don't like you, or maybe they don't want to collaborate. Um, I've always found trying to put yourself into their shoes and understand what they may be going through, what their projects are like, what, you know, what their role is, if they have, you know, different expectations from their leadership, whatever it may be, but what are they going through that's driving them to kind of like, you know, create friction between the two of you. And, and then also, you know, being very transparent while being respectful is good too. So sometimes it's just great to be able to set them down and say, hey, like, I really want this to work. I would love for us to be able to collaborate. Um, please tell me how we, I could work to do that better and ask for feedback. Um, if they're not open to that, then um, there are a lot of opportunities for you to seek a third party and to kind of, you know, get somebody else involved to say, okay, hey, how can we work on this together better? Um, and now there are a lot of companies that offer good resources to be able to encourage that communication uh, and to be open, but definitely respect and empathy, I think, go a long way. And then always remember, you know, be the bigger person. Uh, even if you know that it wasn't because of something you did, that will always help you in the long run. It will always help you, even if you don't see that for several months or even a year, it, there, someone is always going to remember how you made them feel. They might not remember what you say, but they're going to remember how you made them feel. And what about you, Erica? Have you dealt with uh, difficult coworkers, either in the Olympics or at Coca-Cola? <laughs> I was actually clapping for Tiffany because I thought she really hit the nail on the head and answered that in every possible way. But oh, yeah. I, I deal, everyone has dealt with a difficult coworker or, you know, teammates that are ultra competitive, um, but she's really covered a lot of ground. The only thing I would add is don't be so quick to respond just in general when someone rubs you the wrong way. I mean, how many of us have gotten an email and you want to go da -da 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 and just respond back? And I actually practice this and I always walk away and then I say, well, actually, the truth is I type and then I don't send it. And then I say, is it kind? Is it true? And is it necessary? It has to pass all three because if it doesn't, I don't send it. And I can tell you when I'm in a weird situation like that, nine times out of 10, I don't send it because it's missing one of those ingredients. Because as Tiffany has shared before, you know, it's not, it's how you make people feel that they're gonna remember you by. So that's it. That's all I have to add. Oh no, I completely agree. Or even being early in my career too, that was something really important that I learned. Sometimes when you get that email, you just need to step away <laughs> and, and sit on it for a bit. Awesome. So, um, so learning, um, moving on to question number five, my problem is getting in the field, which I don't have any experience. So how do I get past this? So let's kick this over to David. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's the volunteer aspect. I'm not necessarily sure of the field that you're looking to, uh, to get into, but, uh, uh we see, uh, you know, in my area of work, we see that a lot of times that there's other layers there, you know, where it gives an op a person an opportunity to, to play, maybe not an official role, but, you know, gets to be able to show a little bit of what they can do, things like that. And network, uh, do as much res research as you can, but networking is huge. Uh, a friend of a friend sometimes can open a lot of doors for you. So uh, sometimes you have to figure out some different ways to sort of take a look at it. Uh, to get your introduction and an opportunity to be seen. So if I could add to that, Dorian, because I, I saw the question in the chat box and um, the individual mentioned they have a criminal justice degree. So 
I just want to talk through that a little bit. I can see and empathize how right out of college, a lot of those very specific fields might require, you know, experience that you don't have, but you got to get it somewhere, right? So happy to say that my major is in criminal justice and I don't do anything with criminal justice, but to me it was, I thought that's where I wanted, I, I thought I wanted to work for the FBI or the CIA, but I realized later that if I got experience in with a big company in general, I can maybe do that later, right? So I just went down the path of basic business and sales and account management. I just sort of landed there. And my brother would always text me before I reached 35 and say, come on, you're getting too old to join the FBI. But I had learned that the things I'm passionate about, I was more excited about working for Coca-Cola than I was. And then I got used to making money because for the government, you don't make as much money. So I decided I didn't want to use my criminal justice degree. So I think just work for a, a company that you love and learn different tracks. Hopefully you're still young and you can uh, navigate later. All right. The next question is here. So this person said that I'm still early in my career, but eager for a promotion. What are some ways I can show my boss that I want advancement opportunities? I'll jump in <laughs> on that one. All right. Um, let me say this first. <laughs> you know, you when, when you're coming into a, a job market and especially early on in your, in your career, you also have to acknowledge that the work that you do and based upon your job description, what they give you to do, that's what you're getting paid for. So ultimately, if you do your job, that doesn't always guarantee that you're going to get a promotion or you're going to get a bonus because you're doing what you agreed to do and what your job description is. Above and beyond is above and beyond your scope of work and making sure that you're you know, making yourself available for new projects and volunteering and, and being a good coworker and helping in areas when help is needed. So th there is a difference there that, you know, hey, you know, I did everything I was supposed to do on my job description this year, you know, yep, fantastic. That's great. Thank you for your work. You're a valued employee, but you did what you contracted to do. And I think that's important for young people to understand when they go into a job market. I would say to piggyback off of what David said, Dorian, um, <clears throat> you know, asking for opportunities that either do exist or maybe even don't um, be bold and, and say, you know, come, come to the table with ideas. Uh, just because it's not on the docket of responsibilities, maybe, or on the project list, doesn't mean that you couldn't make something really cool out of nothing and um, fill a need that that exists, but, you know, they haven't gotten to yet, especially if you're willing to take on the extra work. Um, and maybe also volunteer to, to do those messy projects, right, that we talked about earlier, the ones that are not glamorous, that people hate to do, that are maybe, you know, kind of the the worst things, but if you had an opportunity to really shine and you whipped that into shape and made it better than what it was, that's a great return. You're solving a problem and you're also showing some extra skills that they may not know you have. Um, and my last thing would be for the females in the audience. Um, I read a book a long time ago that talked about how women interact differently in the workplace than men. And a lot of times as women, we wait for the opportunities to pre be presented to us because we don't want to seem pushy. We're, you know, maybe a little more shy. Um, and a lot of times we get passed up because of that. So ask, ask to do things, uh, volunteer, um, and don't stop and don't assume that they're going to come back to you. Um, because honestly, sometimes it's just because your bosses or your managers, they get busy. They've got a lot of stuff to do. Um, so just keep asking, keep volunteering, keep looking for opportunities um, that you can collaborate or lead a project or provide a solution. 
Dorian, if I may just add like a final touch to what both Tiffany and David said. So mm -hmm. along the lines of everything they, they said put together, an added layer could be to find a champion or an ambassador, or you may call them a mentor that can help you put yourself out there and give you exposure. So if you do all the steps that Tiffany and David talked about, where you identify a project, a need, you need a champion to help you bring it forward. That's a higher level. So to me, that's what mentors do too. They help champion your career and be your ambassador. All right. Looks like we have time for maybe one more question. So our last question would be, um, I'm trying to get out of a job that I don't enjoy, but I'm not finding success in the industry that I want. Would you suggest compromising and taking a new role that I'm not interested in? I don't quite follow the question. So it looks like they're, I'll, I'll say it one more time. So I'm trying to get out of a job that I don't enjoy, but they're not finding success in an industry that they want. So would you suggest compromising and taking a new role that I'm not as interested in instead of like leaving the industry altogether? Um, for me, my, my, one of the things that drives me forward in a lot of major decisions um, is Am I going backwards? Um, and sometimes you have to, like I'm, I've told y'all, you know, I went back to college, I took a pay cut to build my resume, um, but there was still always a forward moving component to that. Um, and so I would say, you know, really practice some self-reflection and understand what am I doing now that I enjoy? What are the consequences or what are, what are the results if I make this change? And is there an opportunity for me to push pause on this, you know, specific area that I'm interested in and hone some skills that may come out of taking a new role in a completely different shift? Um, and like Erica mentioned earlier, you know, we didn't always set out to do what we're doing right now. And, you know, having a degree in criminal justice isn't what she's using now. There's a lot of professionals and a lot of higher level executives that have that same story. So it's not really about keeping it all in line, but it's, you know, you could look at it like you're diversifying yourself and you're taking a moment or a few years even to practice some different skills that will eventually ladder up to a bigger career or a more diverse position. Um, but ultimately, I think you just have to be okay with knowing what that those results will be of making that change. Or if you really do wanna try to make the best of your situation um, and take on, you know, continue down the path that you're on. All right, these are all awesome answers. So thank you all for, um, for this insightful conversation. That's all the time that we have today for questions. So I'll um, pass this along to Aaron to wrap this up. Thanks. Thanks, Dora. Um, that was an awesome discussion. And so on behalf of Boys and Girls Clubs of America, I wanna thank each of our panelists, Tiffany, Erica, and David, as well as our moderator, Dorian, for such a robust and insightful conversation today. We truly hope you took away some quality advice to find greater fulfillment and satisfaction in your own future jobs. And I know I took away quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I invite you to visit bgca.org slash workforce to learn a little bit more about how Boys and Girls Clubs are preparing millions of young people for great futures. And thanks again and have a great rest of your day. Mm -hmm.